Good evening to you. Good to see you. Good to be with you. Good to worship God together. As always, we have some tonight that weren't with us this morning. We're thankful to have you present with us tonight to study God's Word, to worship together. I invite you to take your Bibles and be open to the epistle of 1 Peter. 1 Peter. As I was mentioning to April, I think one of the weaknesses of my preaching through the years is a lack of more textual sermons. Uh, and I would like to do a little bit more of that and begin with an emphasis in First Peter by taking a section of this first chapter together to study through tonight. So first Peter, and with that, just a brief introduction, one that's provided in a New Testament commentary by Wayne Jackson. But uh, the author, he says, of course, claims to be Peter, as you look at the very first word probably in your Bibles, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And he says, if such does not represent the truth of the matter, the book is a forgery, it's not to be trusted in any particular. But the earliest Christian writers had no doubt about the authenticity of the document. Evidence for its genuineness is as strong as could be desired. It is quoted by Polycarp, a disciple of John the Apostle, and Tertullian, Irenaeus, refers to it by name, Clement of Alexandria, quotes from each chapter of the book. The internal evidence is equally strong. Clearly, the writer was personally familiar with Jesus, indeed a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as stated in chapter 5 and verse 1. There is a striking similarity between the style of this letter and Peter's sermons that we find in the book of Acts. If we think about the date of the writing of 1 Peter, the epistle appears to be aware of Paul's early prison epistles. There's some parallels that you find, thus must have been penned after these letters, but it apparently was written before the death of Nero Caesar, AD 68, since history assigns Peter's death to the infamous ruler. It most likely was penned in late 64, early 65, same source. And then the purpose of 1 Peter. The purpose of the, of the epistle is explicitly stated by the apostle himself in the last chapter Chapter 5, verse 12, I've written unto you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast therein. The Christians addressed in the epistle were beginning to feel the sting of physical violence. Their faith was being tested by a fiery trial. Hence, they needed encouragement. Some may have been weakening and the apostle was determined to attempt an infusion of spiritual strength. I found a description of 1 Peter that I thought was quite appropriate, entitled, A Sojourner's Guide to Hope. You look at the opening verse of 1 Peter, chapter 1 and verse 1, and what do we read? Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims or sojourners. Um, temporary residence. You may have something that reads a little bit differently, but the same point. And then in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, he says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. It's a good reminder to, it was a good reminder to them, and it's a good reminder to Christians in every generation, and that's how Jacob, we just studied it in Genesis, right? When he appeared before Pharaoh, how did he how does he describe, or maybe we haven't got to it quite yet in our class, but how, we, we certainly have in our, our chapter we're presently in. How does, how does Jacob describe uh, his years upon earth? He says, my pilgrims or my sojourn. He, he viewed himself as this world is not my home. And Peter wanted his Christian readers, and he wants, of course, us Christian readers today, we need to keep that perspective. We're sojourners, we're pilgrims, we're alien residents, I think some of your translations maybe render it. But a sojourner's guide to hope. And there's a lot of emphasis on hope. We find it in verse 3. He speaks of the 
living hope that Christians have in verse 13 of chapter 1. He says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Also in chapter 1, verse 21, Who through Him believe in God, who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. In chapter 3, in verse 15 of 1 Peter, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. As we just stated, the purpose of this letter, these Christians' faith need to be strengthened. They need hope. They're, they're presently experiencing suffering. They're presently experiencing fiery trials. In fact, every single chapter mentions the sufferings that they were presently experiencing. And so I did find this an appropriate description that I'm borrowing and using in our study, a sojourner's guide to hope. That's 1 Peter. And so, as I said, I want to take a section of our text in this first chapter to really focus our attention on tonight, and that's the first 12 verses of 1 Peter chapter 1. So let's read those together. Join me in our reading of the scripture. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it, be, it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things which angels desire to look into. Oh, that's beautiful, that text, isn't it? And a lot there. The opening statement, as we continue, uh, consider excuse me, the salutation, these first two verses, the opening statement identifies the author, as we already noted, as Peter, an apostle of Christ. The recipients are the elect. You know, Christians, we are frequently referred to in God's Word as God's elect are chosen. In fact, we read this scripture together this morning. Maybe you missed it, but Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12 in that context of putting off the old man and those sinful deeds and putting on the new man. We read in verse 12, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on, right? So that's one of those scriptures, but we just use that. Now, this does not mean that each child of God was specifically chosen. 
before the foundation of the world for salvation, while others were arbitrarily predestined for condemnation. That's Calvinism. That's what Calvinism contends. It contends that God chose a certain group of people to be saved, and thus that tells us He chose all the others, the rest, to be lost. But how absurd is it, think about it, to argue that God commissioned the gospel to be preached to every creature, to all creation, when a vast number had already been chosen for eternal damnation. No, the, the truth is God chose a type of person, the one who is humble, the one who is obedient in disposition, who would himself or herself determine to enter into Christ by obedience to the truth, as we read in such passages as Romans 6 and Galatians chapter 3. But also, as we read in the text together, the letter is designed to be read, the initial recipients at least, by several churches in five provinces in Asia Minor. And they're identified as Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And you may have a map, maps in the back of your Bible where you can find these places in just a moment. Our next slide, we're going to look at that uh, momentarily. But the people had been uprooted from their na native countries, and therefore they were sojourners. They were pilgrims in the region. The New American Standard Bible addresses it to those who reside as aliens. Those who reside as aliens, as strangers, again, temporary residents. Isn't that how the ancient patriarchs are described to us in Scripture? And as I pointed out, that's how Jacob himself described himself to Pharaoh when he stood before him. He referred to his pilgrimage, the years of his pilgrimage or his sojourning upon this earth. Um, that's how the Hebrew writer speaks of them in, in that great book. And that's how Christians are described. We are described as, as well. But they were Jews dispossessed of their native land. So again, it was Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. That's some large areas. Look at the map. Here's Cappadocia. We know Galatia and we know Asia. Those two we're most familiar with in our studies of the New Testament, right? And then up here, way up here to the north, you have Bithynia and Pontus. But that's a large area that Peter is addressing. These are the recipients of this letter, Christians in the churches of those areas. Now, think about the first preaching journey of, of Paul. And this is something that uh, we've, we've studied recently in our homes with the college students. Uh, we studied the first half of Acts and we, we got through um, the first uh, preaching journey. But those churches of Galatia were established in the first preaching journey. So Antioch of Pisidia, uh, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, but here we're just dealing with the south. Galatia goes all the way up here to the north. And then we're familiar a lot with Asia, aren't we? Uh, of course, we have seven churches of Asia uh, addressed by Christ in the book of Revelation, but there are other churches of Asia as well that are not uh, addressed, such as Troas and others. But just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, who this letter, the recipients originally were of First Peter. Now notice in our text again in the salutation how they're addressed in verse 2. He says, The elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Do you notice what we have there in verse 2? We have the Godhead, don't we? We have sometimes what's referred to as the Trinity. But we have God the Father, we have the the, the Spirit, and we have Christ, all referenced there. So they were the elect according to the foreknowledge of God. You know, the church, we know ecclesia. Ecclesia is an assembly or congregation is what that Greek word means. But when we find the word church in your Bible, it's this word, ecclesia. And so called out. The ecclesia in the New Testament is, is a group of people who have been called out of the world into God. And it's the church, right? It's, a, it's, it's those who 
have obeyed Christ, have, have uh, surrendered their will to Christ, have been called out of the, uh, the world, the power of darkness, and conveyed or transferred, Colossians 1.13, into the kingdom, into the church. But the elect, according to the foreknowledge, the planning of God, and it resulted in their sanctification. Sanctification just simply means the setting apart. And how were they set apart? They were set apart by means of the Spirit. The Spirit did what? The Spirit's revelation, the Spirit's instruction through the preaching of the gospel. And such led to their obedience, Peter says, at which point the cleansing effect of Christ's blood was applied on their behalf. But I think that's so neat. In one verse, so concise, we have the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the scheme of redemption. Now, one of the things I wanted to point out before we move on there in verse 2, it says, For obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. That idea of the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So if you mark your place here, hold it here in 1 Peter 1, our main text. And go back with me to just a little bit to the book of Hebrews, a few pages uh, earlier in your New Testament, to Hebrews chapter 9. And notice just a few occasions when the Hebrew writer uses that same kind of terminology, the sprinkling of the blood, with, first of all, with the first covenant and the blood from the animals that were sacrificed and in connection with the sins of the people, but also the, the covenant they entered into and then linking that to the, the better blood, the perfect blood of, of Jesus Christ. But in Hebrews chapter 9 and verses 19 through 20, uh, let's do 18 through 22 of Hebrews 9. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet, wool, and hyssop. And notice he sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. Now, think about that. It's one thing, the book, but think if this was us and you're the Hebrews and, and I'm Moses and we just, we just slaughtered these animals, sacrificed these animals, and we have the, the blood of the animals and I'm, I'm, you're getting hit with blood droplets, right? Because he's sprinkling, but I mean, that'd be pretty real, right? They're entering into covenant relationship with God. And that'd be pretty memorable. That'd make an impression as, as blood lands on you, Right? And so he says in verse 20, this is the blood, Moses said to the people of, of Israel, this is the blood of the covenant which God has made or commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified or cleansed with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission, no forgiveness. And then later in ch uh, chapter 10 in verse uh, 22 we're told, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Well, what are our evil heart, our evil conscience being sprinkled with? Our hearts being sprinkled from an evil conscience with? Well, the blood of Christ. And then our bodies washed, there's baptism with water, right? And then come to chapter 12, Chapter 12 and verse 24, where it says, To Jesus Christ, or excuse me, to Jesus the mediator, the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. It seems to be that idea and that imagery still from the Old Testament and to get in our minds in the New Testament. When one obeys Christ and you think about God's plan of salvation, of hearing the gospel, we believe, we're willing to repent, we're going to confess our faith, and then we're buried with him, we're baptized into his death, and that's where the blood's applied, right? Baptized into his death, that blood is, is sprinkled, the blood of sprinkling, Peter speaks of here, connected with our obedience. So the elect according to the foreknowledge of God, God's planning, the church, and I didn't mention this, I just have on the slide, but... Paul says the, the church is according to God's, the ecclesia is according to God's eternal purpose, right? There's his foreknowledge, his planning of, of who would be saved. He didn't choose the man, he chose the plan of salvation 
which was revealed by the Spirit, so we'd be set apart unto God, that sanctification, our obedience to Christ, and the cleansing by the blood of Christ. And, verse, and, and then he, we end there in verse 2 of our Bibles, going back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Peter says, Grace to you, and peace be multiplied. So a multiplied measure of grace and peace is extended. And then our longer section for tonight, verses 3 through 12, thanksgiving for salvation. Thanksgiving for salvation. So, looking in your Bibles, just follow along there, beginning in verse 3, where he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God is praised as the Father of Christ, and it speaks right away, Peter does, of his mercy. How God's been merciful. He says it's an abundant mercy, and that he has granted to us what kind of hope? A living hope. To be contrasted with what, then? Hope that's not real, a hope that is, doesn't, is not true and genuine, a hope that's dead. We have a living hope. And I'd say Norm P. spoke to this at the table tonight. Jesus is alive, he's living, he's existing, he's seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And it's because of him and his resurrection <laughs> that we have a living hope, Right? Isn't that what he says? A living hope through what? What's the next thing that he says? This living hope is made certain by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. That's his very next statement or phrase there in our New Testaments. That's exactly what Peter emphasized and the apostles emphasized in the first gospel sermon in Acts 2 in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost is that David the prophet said, and you're, you're not going to leave the Christ his his soul in Hades, nor allow his body to see corruption. And he says, David's tomb is with us today. His remains are there. He's speaking of Christ, the Messiah, the Lord. He's been raised from the dead, is what he preaches. And it is accessed, Peter tells us, by means of our being born again, begotten. The new birth process that Jesus spoke of with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And we'll get into that a little bit later in our lesson tonight as well as in perhaps our next lesson as we continue in chapter 1 of First Peter. But that's a lot stated there in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then notice how Peter describes our living hope. He says an inheritance. Now when you think of an inheritance, don't you think of a family connected connection there that uh, children may be receiving inheritance from, from parents or grandparents. Well, if we've been begotten, if we've been born again, what happened? We entered into the family of God. Now, as children of God, now we are blessed with receiving an inheritance. Not anything we deserve, just like, you know, maybe parents or grandparents out of their love for us. We didn't work for it, we didn't earn it, and, and, and they gift us, they pass on some inheritance to us. Well, because we're children of God, here through this living hope we have, because of the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we have an inheritance. Now, how is that an inheritance described? It's incorruptible. It will never perish. It's undefiled. It's clean. The book of Revelation speaks of how there's no sin there, right? It's free from sin where we're going. Uh, it's unfading with the passage of time. And it's reserved where? It's reserved in heaven, not on earth. And I want to emphasize that as many commentators contend, modern commentators contend that it's on earth. In fact, some in the Lord's church, some gospel preachers in recent years have been preaching such, teaching such. That's not the case. It's reserved in heaven where Christ is, not on this earth. This is the one hope, Ephesians 4, 4, elsewhere promised in the New Testament. But what a description. We have a living hope. Those of us who have been begotten of God, we have a living hope 
because of the resurrection of Christ, an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, unfading, reserved in heaven. And I, I love how personal Peter makes it. Notice back in the text, if you want to look at it again, but he says, reserved in heaven for you. Reserved in heaven for you. Okay? Isn't that awesome? You think of some maybe nice places if you stayed in? I can think of some nice places I've stayed in, hotels. Um, places, you know, you're in it for a few days or whatever, and boy, those are nice places. You've made reservations. Nothing's going to compare, right? <laughs> Nothing's going to come close to the reservation that the child of God has waiting for us in heaven. Now, he goes on to say in verse 5, who are kept, speaking of those who have been begotten, born again to a living hope, the saved Christians, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation. So the security of the saints is guarded, kept by divine power, but notice through their faith or through our faith. Because without faith it's impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So then faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And, or as Paul says in Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But the final goal is to be reached and the salvation to be revealed at the last time. That's how the verse 5 ends, right? Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, which would be when our Lord returns. Salvation has three tenses. I think this is interesting. Salvation has three tenses. There's the past tense, we find it used in Scripture, and that's one example, Titus 3, the time of one's baptism. There's the present tense, 1 Corinthians 1, 18, ongoing process of growth. And then, as we see it used here as well, future tense, salvation, ultimate salvation, eternal salvation at the time of the Lord's return. So, notice with me, hold your place here again, just... Go to Titus real quick, and let's grab that. Titus chapter 3, and verses 4 and 5. But, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, past tense, through, we're told how, the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. There's a lot of verses like that, right? Writing to Christians, speaking of their past salvation at the time of their baptism. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, when we look at a present tense example of salvation, something that is ongoing and occurring presently. Um, verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 1, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, see that present tense? It is the power of God. So had the, those that he's writing to Corinth been saved? Well, he's writing to the church of God. He referred to them as saints. We read in Acts 18, Acts 18 verse 8, And many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So yeah, they had been saved from their sins, but... That's past now and presently, those who are being saved. And then going back to our current text, present text of 1 Peter chapter 1, notice in verse 9, he says, receiving the end of your faith. So not the beginning, not the middle, but receiving the end of your faith. What do we receive at the end of our faith? Well, the salvation of your soul. More proof and evidence that there's no such thing as once saved, always saved. Yes, we are initially saved, our sins are washed away, but then we need to continue to uh, be faithful to God and grow, as we've been studying the last two Sunday mornings. And then ultimately, we're looking forward to the eternal salvation, receiving the end of our faith when we cross that finish line. 
of our spiritual race to heaven. And Peter says there, and going back to our text in verse 6, while we greatly rejoice at this prospect, the Lord's return, and he speaks of that joy, the reality is there may be a little while, relatively speaking, during which we must suffer grief, being subjected to various forms of trials. And he says that's test of your faith. So here's a quote going back to the commentary by Wayne Jackson, where he says, trials are not punishments for sin, but benevolent concessions to prove the quality of one's faith. If it is the case that one recognizes the value of precious metal like gold by the purifying process of fire, how much more is one's precious faith to be verified by the persecutions he endures? Surely such will receive the praise, glory, and honor at the time Jesus is revealed by his second coming. As I said, these Christians that Peter is writing to are going through suffering at this time. Every single chapter, and some of them multiple times, is dealing with suffering, persecution. And so this was a very real thing for them. And why I think that Sojourner's Guide for, for, for Hope is a perfect description. What do you need when you're going through a lot of suffering? I need hope. I need to know there's something better at the end of this. And if I get, and if I get through this and I remain loyal to Christ, and Peter says there, there is, and he comes right out of the gate in chapter 1, the opening verses with that promise and that truth. And don't forget this inheritance and what kind of inheritance it is and how it's reserved for you in heaven. And your hope is a living hope because of you serve a risen Savior, right? And so, yes, it's hard. Yes, it's tough. And so... You greatly rejoice about the end and when Christ comes again, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved, you've been distressed by these various trials. And of course, we too, brethren, are today grieved by various trials, aren't we? But understand those various trials are testing our faith to test and prove our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, for them, a lot of it seemed to be actual physical persecution because they're Christians. And there are Christians in the globe, in our world today, that suffer physical persecution like those we read about in the Bible. I read reports of it in various places. He also speaks in this letter of verbal persecution. They speak evil of you, right? They're using their mouth, their lips, to slander you because of who you are and the way you're living. Well, that's something we can more relate to. I, I, I hope we don't have to relate so much to that, but one day we may. But we can relate to some of that uh, from those in this world and how they speak of us and treat us. But, there, you know, he said various trials. That's, that's what James speaks of. We used that passage this morning in James 1. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter or fall into various trials. Because there is a variety of trials in life, Right? And sometimes it may be actual persecution because you're a child of God and I'm a child of God. It, it may come in the form of cancer. And it seems like all the time we're hearing about someone else that's been diagnosed with cancer. I just did recently, a friend of mine I went to school with that lives in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and had some places on his leg and just wasn't feeling right. He'd been playing in some racquetball, so he thought it might be soreness, but thankfully he went and got checked out and just had an appointment at Vanderbilt this past week and still waiting to find out what, what everything looks like. But uh, the initial word did not sound good. But loved ones that are going through that trial or have gone through it uh, of cancer or some other disease, heart disease, liver disease, kidney disease. There's so many diseases, right? There's autoimmune diseases. And sometimes I think there are those who maybe make light of that, and certainly we shouldn't because that's very real, and people deal with that on a daily basis. That's a trial. Uh, the death of a loved one. Obviously, we're grieved by those kind of trials, and it does test our faith. And we need passages, like we need books like 1 Peter to help us, to strengthen us. 
caring for an ailing parent or an ailing loved one, uh, a spouse, uh, a, a parent, a grandparent, uh, is, is, is certainly challenging to say the least. Jeff Anderson has been going through a lot of that and many of you have done that uh, and, and many of us will do that. Uh, maybe it's an oppressive boss at work. <laughs> uh, you, you like your job, but boy, that, that he or she makes it uh, extremely difficult to really enjoy it because of the way they, they treat you and speak to you. And I know there's more than one in the audience uh, without naming you that can, can speak to that. Uh, for some, it's maybe marital strife that's uh, happening uh, in their home. But there's various trials that we're grieved by. And they're for a little while, for a little while, he reminds us, right? The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us, Romans 8 and verse 18. You know, I love what he says, Peter goes on to say in this text, although we have not yet personally seen Jesus, nonetheless, we, we love him. We continue to love him. We believe in him. Kind of reminds me of what Jesus said to Thomas after Thomas finally was convinced that Jesus was, in fact, resurrected from the dead when he could look upon him and see his wounds. And, and Jesus is encouraging him to, to, okay, go ahead. I know what you said earlier. Put your, put your hand, put your finger here and, put, and, and reach your hand here. Don't be unbelieving, but be believing. And, and he was, my Lord and my God, he declared. And then Jesus said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Peter is writing to those kind of Christians. Peter had seen him. Peter had been with him. Peter had uh, seen him arrested, uh, betrayed and arrested and crucified and resurrected. On, on multiple occasions he saw the risen Savior. But those he wrote to in Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia and Bithynia did not have that luxury. And yet he said to them, verse 8, whom having not seen or known, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. That's who Jesus was talking about in John 20 and verse 29. And, and Peter was writing to and, and who he and Peter would be writing the same things to us, right? We haven't laid our physical eyes upon him, but we believe in him and we love him just the same. And this results in happiness and joy beyond our ability, Peter says, to express and full of glorifying God. And this is to be realized when our faith has reached its goal, as we talked about earlier, our final and full salvation. And then in, in verses 10 through 12, of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow, to them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. So you think about God's wonderful plan of salvation, a scheme of redemption, how it had been in preparatory process across the ages. And concerning all those messianic prophecies, the ancient prophets, such as Isaiah, which use him as an example, longing and wondering as to the nature of the salvation of the grace that eventually should come, right? They pondered the manner of time when these obscure predictions of the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow might be ultimately realized. And as they made their prophetic declarations, they somehow had an understanding sufficiently plain to realize that their messages were not to be fulfilled in their own day and time, but to a later generation, that they were ministering to us, right? The prophets were ministering to you, Peter says. Isn't that neat? They're ministering to you about these things. And those important matters are tied to the gospel message, the good news, I think the ESV says, which has been brought to you by those messengers who have spoken by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. He said the Holy Spirit sent from heaven that Jesus spoke of to the apostles shortly before his crucifixion and that we see in Acts chapter 2, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? And the guidance, he'll guide you into all truth. Peter being one of those recipients of the Holy Spirit, right, that was sent from heaven as an apostle. 
But think about it. So important is this message that even the angels in heaven are intrigued by it. Want to look into it. That tells us that even God didn't just inform them of all his plans and the timings of it as well. Well, that's 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. A lot of richness there and more things that we could have said if we had time. But Peter emphasized that he's writing to those who had been born again. Jesus declared, you must be born again. Right there in John chapter 3. You must be born of water and the Spirit. Have you been born again? God's mercy, His abundant mercy, as Peter describes it, is offered to one and all. And so I would ask you, why not be begotten again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead? Believe in Him. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Him. And be baptized into Him. Be born again of water and the Spirit. Be raised to walk in newness of life and be faithful to Him. If you be subject to the Lord's invitation, let that be known as we stand and as we sing.